Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, very inspiring lecture. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to uh, ask your views about, uh, like in the UN negotiations, we are asking the governments to contribute to the Green Climate Fund. And IIED and other organizations are very particular about um, uh, having a stronger stand at the negotiations. But is there a forum where we are asking the private sector, which has most of the wealth, even in the developed countries, to contribute to the Green Climate Fund? And how can we advocate and uh, press and make that impression on the private sector that they have to drive this climate transition, not just the governments of the developed world? Thank you. Let's take three at a time, and then the lady in the, in the white shirt, and yeah. Exactly, you. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Denton, for an insightful and practical perspective on Africa's role in climate change strategy. In the recent IPCC Working Group 2 report, um, the urgent need for adaptation and mitigation action to protect areas most at risk from climate change was a recurring theme, especially in African regions in danger of drought and desertification. And ecosystem-based approaches to adaptation were indicated to be something that could potentially have a huge positive effect on these areas. And as you mentioned, many of these economies depend directly on the provision of natural ecosystem services. So from your experiences in these areas, what potential do you see for ecosystem restoration projects in Africa's climate change narrative? Somebody else here, please? And we will take these three and go to another round. Thank you. Thanks, Fatima, that was a, a wonderful um, talk. I was just wondering if you were in a position to advise the countries in, um, who have recently found oil or gas in Eastern Africa, what, what you'd be suggesting they do at this point? <laughs> An easy one. <laughs> okay, let's go for these three, and then we will go for another round. Fatima. Thanks. I, I probably would start with Claire's um, question. I, I think I was in a meeting not so long ago when somebody was advocating that they, they keep the oil and gas underground <laughs> and not extract it. But I think the, the broader issue is that extractives that have also not contributed to wider development. You know, um, the, the, the profit you know, from extractive have served a very small fraction of African you know, um, community and perhaps even elite. Um, so, um, the problem that I see is that um, you know there are all sorts of environmental issues related to extractives, um, and I think that I is doing some really good work um, through um, Steve's um, program on on extractive, and I think you perhaps need to start with artisanal small scale mining, you know, to sensitize people about you know the the, the um, implications you know of um, extracting minerals and what that does to the environment. But at the same time, it's a really hard ask to governments because many of them see extractives as the core of their economies. Um, and so how do you, on the one hand, ask them to basically move towards sustainable livelihoods for broader um, society, but at the same time, you know, um, tell the, um, talk to them about environmental issues? So I think one needs to find a, a good balance. And I would say that starting by sensitizing local people at that level, especially at small scale, small scale mining, uh, which very, very often is on that periphery, and trying to see how you could get them to understand you know, what, um, what the dangers are, you know, and what it means to the environment. And perhaps that would be one way of uh, making sure that governments see this as an important issue and might probably bring that on their political radar screen. Um, there was a question on, on ecosystems. Um, yes, I think, I think um, the whole issue of ecosystems um, adaptation is fundamental um, because you know, by doing ecosystem adaptation, you're also restoring you know, um, the very services that are necessary uh, for the ecosystem. Um, and I think that there are a number of countries, I mentioned Benin um, in terms of its reforestation program that are doing that already. Because I think we have to really gear towards this view that the resources that we have are finite. And I know we also have a tendency of conflating everything to climate change. There are some 
are the structural problems that are affecting the environment. And Africa does have um, a history of having also, uh, you know, problems relating to soil fertility. You know, in fact, I know a soil um, expert who says that the, the biggest problem is not so much climate change as far as he's concerned, it's the problem of soil fertility. So I think we have to find a way of also addressing some of those very structural problems that are there. But I think restoring, you know, the balance um, ecosystem services um, and starting with um, afforestation and reforestation pro um, programs um, is probably the way to go. But but in a way that makes, um, you know, that would provide the kind of scale that we're talking about. I think very often these things are done, but you know, on, on a kind of micro level. So if we're able to do it at a level that would emphasize the scale needed to really see that restoration process, I think it would be very important. Um, there's a question on, on green climate, the Green Climate Fund and the, the private sector. Yeah, I think very often the private sector is like the elephant in the room in many ways. And I think we need to find a way of um, ensuring that the private sector is very much part of this. But my sense is also that the private sector is also not fully sensitized in terms of what would this mean in terms of returns on investment. So I think part of bringing the private sector so that it doesn't just remain within the domain of the state is to enable the private sector to understand that there are profits to be had in energy projects, in forestry projects, in even water projects. But that means that the private sector has to be sensitized. Um, I think there are some countries where private sector is already interested. I know of Senegal where the private sector is already <coughs> part of the government's delegation that goes to the conference of parties. And that's because they see that this is, you know, um, they, um, they, have a, they, have, they have stakes in this and they want to be able to um, take advantage of that. So I think it's slowly, um, you know, as government realize that the, you know, the, the playing field is actually quite big and it doesn't have to be occupied by governments alone. And I think they will begin to free up some space so the private sectors and other important stakeholders can, can be part of this. Do you want to comment on any of this? Uh, I'd like to listen to more um, questions from the audience, but I'm really glad that you mentioned soils. And I know there's a gentleman down here who's also particularly happy that you mentioned soils. <laughs> <laughs> so here, do you have a mic? Um, where, is the, where are the mics? Yeah? Okay. I wasn't going to talk about soils, but the, the University of Bonn's analysis, which I think is probably the best, has come up with a figure of something like 25% of the land area of sub-Saharan Africa being severely degraded. It's a huge amount. But what I was going to say was, I'm very much liked the elements of your strategy and I wonder whether you think there's a real potential for a common, maybe even unified, African approach in the negotiations as we go forward and what would it take and what do we have to do to help that happen? Thank you. The gentleman here and more mics around here. <laughs> there. Some women. Raising your hand, please. <laughs> I have only men in this one. <laughs> okay, please. Andrew Ross from Global Garden. You didn't mention China at all in your lecture. Could you say something about the way in which the USA and China seem to be converging in some kind of climate change agreement? and how that will affect Africa. Great. Please. Hi. Um, yes, you mentioned about a number of you know, 50 plus African countries singing off the same hymn sheet, being very powerful. Uh, I was just wondering whether there were countries, particular countries, that were changing the narrative within the group, any champions there, and not just sort of, you know, develop versus developing and all that sort of stuff, but more within, within the group itself. Can you pass your mic to this gentleman? I will give you the floor and we will prepare for the next round. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I didn't quite get your question. Are you asking what would happen within the 54 countries or...? Just, you know, changing narratives. Yeah.
Well, I think perhaps the first concentric circle in responding to that is within what we call the CAHOSC, and that's the Committee of African Heads of State on Climate Change. So, um, I'm not sure exactly how many members are, I'm forgetting, I think it's probably between 18 to 22 African countries that have come together um, to take the issue of climate change a stage further, especially in terms of the political will to do something about it. So I think those countries are talking to each other. But I think in terms of um, what you're proposing, that I haven't seen any evidence of that happening. <coughs> Say, for instance, you take the, the, the champions, or what I would call the champions, um, Rwanda, South Africa, Mozambique, Ethiopia, basically deciding on where do we go with this. But I know that this issue of an alternative space, which doesn't necessarily negate what's happening in the UNFCCC, but it's complementing that because it's basically saying there are certain issues that are costing Africa, you know, far too much in terms of economies, livelihoods. And these issues have not gone anywhere in terms of the negotiations. So the red, red plus, um, those are issues that some, at least, critics have said could be taken out of the UNFCC negotiations, or at least let it continue, but taken in another space where these progressive African countries can actually put, pull their resources together and say, what are we going to do about it? At least have some kind of regional projects you know, that would take some of these problems a bit further down the lane. So I think that has been discussed, but in terms of formalized group of what countries would do within themselves, um, I haven't seen much in the way of um, um, evidence that that is happening. Um, there, was a, there was a question about China. Um, well, um, I think I intuitively <coughs> referred to China because I talked about the fact that, um, you know, the African narrative, rise in narrative to a large extent, um, you know, China is at the a, a centre um, stage in that rise, um, Africa rise in narrative, because a lot of that is um, as a result of extractives, um, um, and China has got a, a big appetite for Africa's extractives. Um, I think for me, it's a welcome, um, it's a welcome sort of um, thing to see. China and the US um, basically coming together and taking a more proactive stance related to climate change. So there, there has been a lot of talk about equity and equity and equities. And I think that the fact that both China and the, the, the US as the biggest polluters are beginning to do something about it. I think um, you know, that's a welcome, it's a welcome stance. Um, and I think to a large extent, I mean, most people have talked about what, would, what should Africa do um, in terms of, you know, going down a different, a different pathway. Um, and I think I've said in the, in the lecture that, that Africa cannot reproduce the same patterns of growth. It has to go down a new lane and a new pattern of growth. Um, and I think when you look at the BRICS countries and China, um, you know, is one of, um, uh, of those countries. There is a lot of trade that's going on between China and Africa. Um, now, I think in terms of partnership, if Africa can also find ways of um, influencing China to the extent that um, at least China um, would, you know, again in that interest of um, self, you know, enlightened self-interest, start doing 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 more in Africa as a way of um, offsetting reductions um, or emissions rather, that I think would be a good thing. But we need to see China act um, in that kind of bold, in bold way. Um, the question on common, an, an African approach. Um, um, can you ask the question again? Because I'm not sure what you meant. You were saying, what would it take to have a common approach, African approach? Um, I think Africa is, is, is beginning to make a huge strides in taking a common approach because I think 10 years ago, you know, there was no such thing. But I think now, if you look at the African group of negotiators, and you know, you've got quite a number of actors in this room, Cindy Kane is one of the actors that um, supports the African group of negotiators, you know, 
the African Climate Policy Center is another one, and um, IAED through <coughs> the LDC as well. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing a group that is becoming more strident, more confident. Um, and I think it starts with confidence. We often very much ignore these soft skills, but you know, you can't go to a negotiation, a global compact of God knows how many countries, if you don't have the confidence to really argue um, in favor of the, your vital interests and what, what is important for your country. So I think they're beginning to show some, some, some unity, um, unity of purpose especially. Um, and they're beginning to understand, and you've got experts, which is the most important thing. Africa is underrepresented, by the way, in terms of its, um, Afri you know, the AGM. Um, and many of the negotiators tend to have to play a kind of jack-of-all-trades role, because they're biodiversity, they're dealing with desertification, all sorts of things. You know, the European Union would go with a whole battalion of um, experts. Um, so I think that that kind of um, asymmetry, um, I think, poses problem. But having said that, the, the African group of negotiators is a lot more aware and technically strong on some of the issues that they're looking at. They've got clusters group, they're working in a more organized, structured format. So I think that will come, you know, that will come. So we have the gentleman here. We have a gentleman there. Oh, let's go. A lady, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I don't actually want to ask a question. I want to, in a sense, applaud your, your lecture by um, mentioning a couple of things I've seen over the last few days in, uh, in Tigre, in these one of the countries that you, uh, that you identified as the leading light. And I think you're, you're right to identify beacons across Africa that will... That will take us towards the vision that you're putting forward. In Tigre, what we see at the moment is, uh, from the analysis that we've done of the climate variability since 1980, we're seeing at the, at the, at, uh, the year 2000, uh, rainfall variability um, has a significant um, increase. We're seeing the disappearance of the short rainy season, we're seeing um, a long rainy season with huge interannual <laughs> variability. And farmers, with the support of science, with the support of the Tigrain Agricultural Research Institute, have responded. And they've not only responded to maintain yields, but they've increased yields. And so we see improved food security across Tigrain now, a place that us Brits think of in terms of famine in, in 1983, 84. And now this is, and, uh, and why is this? And it's, I think it's, 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 it's back to Gordon's soil. There was a huge investment in soil and water conservation, um, it led to, and, and, and that aligned to a move to reduce poverty, so you have mass mobilization, you have social protection aligned to soil and water conservation, and that was the basis for the fact that now adaptation can lead to improved livelihoods. You have a di development dividend. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the Chinese are there, and they are building roads, and roads, according to if, if, if free, are the main, main ways to drive development. So thank you, Chinese people. <laughs> there, please. I am the gentleman here. Yes, thank you for your uh, lecture. It's very um, inspiring. And I, I wanted to ask if you might connect two of your chapters. So one of your chapters was about women and youth voices and leadership in climate debates. And another of your chapters was about stronger governance. and from work we've done around women and youth leadership, uh, neither of those groups feel a lot of faith in formal institutions to represent their <coughs> views and their voices and to um, give them the space for their own style of leadership. Uh, so I'd be interested, and this is an issue not just for Africa, clearly, but maybe you could inspire us with some examples of how youth and women's voices have impacted on climate discussions in Africa. Thank you. The gentleman here. Thank you. Richard Dowden. I'm director of the Royal African Society and a journalist. Um, you, you spoke of China's role in reviving Africa after the terrible decade of the 90s. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, that's certainly true. But the next stage for Africa's uh, revival, if it's to follow the 
econ economist's pattern is that it should get into manufacturing. And the reason it isn't is because of its lack of energy. Uh, some people are trying to deal with this, such as the Ethiopians building the great Renaissance dam, there's Inga uh, in Congo, and various <coughs> other countries looking at big dams. What's your view of, of big dams as a way of providing energy? Thank you. So we go for these three, and we will take the last round. Is there? I saw some. Yes, there. Can you give the gentleman on the... Nick, can you go up there? <laughs> there is a gentleman. Keep your hand up so they will see you. <laughs> yes. Go ahead and we will take the last round afterwards. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to thank Simon um, for, for his comments. Um, I think, basically just, that, just, to, just to add to what you said, um, I think one of the, the sort of main um, drivers, or at least one of the, 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 the problems that um, Africa has in terms of climate change impacts is not so much temperature, it's, it's rainfall. You know, so I think the way in which we can adapt to that sort of shifting variation in terms of rainfall is, is very, very important. But, but, you know, I think we often don't say enough about, you know, leadership. And I think that um, Meles Zenawi was so instrumental to Ethiopia's, you know, taking a leap forward um, in terms of how they deal with this issue. I mean, Meles Zenawi himself said, um, that Ethiopia at one stage was the poster child for everything related to poverty. Um, and, it, and it really took, um, you know, courage, um, conviction and confidence to really take Ethiopia out of that, um, that, that, that situation, you know. Um, and, you know, Simon uh, is no stranger to Ethiopia, he comes there very often, so you've seen just how much you know, um, Ethiopia is making in terms of strides and infrastructurally as well, and also thanks to Chinese money, <laughs> it's able to do this. Um, the, the question about women and youth, um, I mean, I think the issue about governance to a large extent is not so much just an African problem, especially when you connect governance to climate change. I think governance is going to be a serious issue for most countries, but I think in, 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 a, in a region like Africa where we already have a weak governance, then it becomes a bit more complicated. And I think in many ways climate change does unmask, if you like, the huge problems that we have with governments. Who's going to do what and at what level, you know? Um, there's a lot of countries, especially in Francophone Africa, that are going through all these decentralized process. But at what level do you address issues related to adaptation? You know, do you do that at a decentralized level? Do you do that at a national level? Do you do that at a regional level? You know, these, these are issues that um, must be discussed and, and, and addressed. Um, and you know, women and youth, um, I, I mean, I was in a, in a meeting not so long ago and it was very refreshing to see just how much the African youth is becoming more involved in climate change issues. And even talking about these issues in a very intelligent way about climate finance, about the problems that Africa face. But one, one, of the, one of the young women was basically say, it's not enough to just talk about it. We should become, I think she used the term owners of the solution as well. You know? and, and I think that was very interesting for me, especially in a place where we talk very much about equity and the culpability you know, basically talking about historical emissions and, 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 and saying that this is something that somebody else must address. So hearing that kind of narrative and discussions when youth um, are talking about issues related to how can we own the problem, you know. Um, um, I think, I think um, you know, I, I have a feeling that the problem will sort itself, that those dots will be, will be joined somehow, you know, in terms of the youth and women. Um, I, think, uh, I think some of that you can already begin to see, especially in the, the confidence that I'm seeing in African youth and the way they're addressing climate change. Um, Richard, I think, was talking about um, China's role in manufacturing and also about um, big dams. 
Um, I think we all know that the problem that we have, and that's why I was saying that if Africa wants to be a force in the world economy, uh, it's not unimaginable. <laughs> but if it wants to become a force in the world economy, um, it really has to start adding value to its raw material, and industrialization is at the very center of that value addition. And I think you're absolutely right that we can't do it without energy. You know, many of the industrialized nations that we, that we see, um, like I said, we're not able to industrialize without the agricultural <coughs> sector. You know? um, and I think the way in which we perceive agriculture in Africa, I think, needs to change. We have to find a way of turning the problem on its head. Most farmers, I mean, farming is not a sexy business in Africa. Most youth would not want to go into farming because it's, you know, it's, um, it's perceived as uh, the poor man's job. So I think adding value would mean that we have to be able to find ways of making sure that the energy sector is energized, if I can use that word again, in a way that would help. Um, to connect these three sectors, which I think are very important, agriculture, um, the, the, the water sector, you know, and energy. In fact, these three are interrelated. You, know. you, you, you can't produce energy without water, and water is fundamentally important for agriculture. So we have to find a way of trying to connect the dots around those three. Um, in terms of the big, I, I, know, I know about the Inga Dam, and I think it will, um, you know, it has the potential of becoming, in terms of producing electricity, um, a, a really, really um, sort of strong potential of doing that. I do know that dams have environmental, you know, implications. Um, but having said that, I think we have to be able to think about it in terms of trade-offs as well. You know, we have to be able to measure the, 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 the benefits uh, of that. Um, I don't know so much about the Ingada, but I know about, um, I'm trying to remember the name, um, the dam in Mali. Uh, no, not that one. There's another one. Selingay. Is it Selingay? This is the one that it shares with Senegal. And it is part of the, yes, the Manantali Dam. You know, and the Manantali Dam is a really good example because, again, there are also huge issues about geopolitics. Um, the Senegalese government was basically saying that they're more interested in, you know, sustainable agriculture, and the Mali government was saying that they're more interested in electricity generation. You know, so how you kind of join those interests? Sometimes it's difficult. You know, but you know there was a report. I think it was the Michigan State University that wrote a really damning sort of report that. Um, about dams and the sort of environmental implications and all of that, and it, it almost didn't see the sort of the light of day. But when you weigh it against some of these other benefits, sustainable agriculture, you know, electricity production, jobs, etc., you know, for the riparian countries, it makes economic sense. So I think that's the way to look at it, really. Do we have time for the last round? Okay. Uh, so, oh my God. Okay, here we have. There, there is one, there is two, and I have only one to go, so I will choose the lady here. <laughs> there is another lady there? Two ladies there. Four. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go there. Okay, um, uh, Ivan Bio from uh, Farm, Farm Africa. Um, Fatima, I, I certainly like the sound of that new narrative uh, around climate change in, in terms of opportunities for business and for a renewed social contract. I think there is, there is a lot of depth in there and for us to reflect on. Um, I also liked a lot what you were saying about agriculture and farming just now and about soil uh, from the perspective of the new organization I work for. Um, I, I, you were talking a lot about business and about uh, about private sector on the one hand and about, and about governance and, and, and the state. Um, you weren't really talking about civil society. So my, my question is, um, what's, what's the small thing civil society can do to, have, to, to, to make a, a, a kind of significant contribution to, to building on that opportunity? Thank you. There? 
Try to be brief so we can all. Sure. Um, hello, my name is Adrian Fenton. I'm a researcher at the University of Leeds. Um, there's a growing interest in the role of self-self cooperation in policy discussions at the moment. Uh, with this in mind, my question is, in your opinion, what scope and need is there for an African Solidarity Fund to help finance some of the mitigation activities you suggested are required? Thank you. My name is Caroline Moser. Um, I guess it's a bit of an anarchic question because um, you've talked a lot about governments and you've talked a lot about leadership and you've given us in the, particularly one example um, of a, obviously an incredibly charismatic leader who has done a lot in Ethiopia and then you've talked about um, youth and women sort of bottom up and what they can do. And my challenge really is to say that, um, um, you know, I want to congratulate you for the power and the position you have. And to say, do you think that actually what is also really effectively needed is a large number of women in really powerful positions, um, uh, or a certain critical mass, to shift agendas? And I just want to relate it to one thing which you've, again, you've been, there's been a lot of discussion about agriculture. But as we know, that agricultural systems in many countries are very patriarchal, they're very complex in terms of land ownership, and yet in many contexts it's the women who are the real farmers. So I just really um, applaud you and, and think that really it's not just sort of women and, and youth and what they do in terms of mobilization and from the bottom, but also the real power of women like yourself and others and getting a real critical of mass at the level of Africa that is going to be so important in pushing these agendas, this new agenda you've spoken about. Thank you. Last one, and then... Thank you. Thank you, Fatima, very much for a great talk. Um, my questions actually come in from Pat Usman Jaju, who is the Gambia's Minister of Environment, Climate Change, Water Resources, Parks and Wildlife. Uh, and you probably also know that he's the first special climate envoy to be appointed from a least developed country. Um, his point is that the LDCs, 34 of which are in Africa, are at the forefront in the UN climate negotiations in calling on all nations to have um, an ambitious mitigation plan. LDC members themselves are taking action. Uh, the Gambia, his country, for example, has submitted its agriculture NAMA, the Mitigation Plan of Action, to the UNFCCC and intends to submit its contribution to the 215 Agreement alongside nations like the US, the EU, China, um, in March 215. So his question is, what would you say to countries such as the Gambia and other LDCs who wish to use their progressive force to foster ambition in this process? And how can they do that? How can they engage with industrial nations and other groups to use climate change as an opportunity, as well as get a treaty that will meet the needs of the most vulnerable? Sorry, it was a long question, but... Thank you. Um, I'll, probably, I'll probably start with that, um, that question, um, Liz, about, um, about LDCs and what they can do. I think... We know that there are some countries that have graduated out of this LDC sort of group, you know, and Cape Verde is one, one good example. But um, I think that is, if you like, the vision of how you get out of that LDC group, um, uh, you know, uh, and become, leave, you know, make the transition from least developed to at least a, a developable middle um, income countries. Um, having said that, I think. I think that the, the climate negotiation um, as a global compact, I think there are far too many countries involved in that. And I think that that cannot be the only avenue, the only sort of um, conduit to be able to get results. Um, we have had countries, um, you know, in Nordic countries, for instance, Sweden, Norway, that have come to us as the Economic Commission for Africa to basically say there are countries in Africa where we have similar views and these are views that we can address in a kind of bilateral 
you know, sort of um, negotiation or discussions. And I think we don't need to take everything to conference of parties because it's usually very adversarial and you're, you're usually at loggerheads or trying to, you know, um, um, basically argue each other out. <laughs> I think, I think what needs to be done is that we can find where is it that countries can come together on a particular issue. You know, it might be agriculture. Perhaps the EU is not too adverse to a particular policy on agriculture and see how you can engage the EU in that way. So I think we need to find ways that would make the, um, the, the global compact itself work. Because I think, again, it's a huge governance issue to want to do everything within the UNF triple C, you know, um, and there's just not enough time or space to do that. So I think we need to be able to graduate out of it, not completely. There are things that it does and it does well, but we have to be able to find other options. So my sense is that progressive countries must identify what is it that works for them, you know, and see how they can actually come to some kind of agreement with other countries that have similar stance rather than take it to a, a, a COP and, you know, be sort of engaged in that kind of, you know, um, adversarial way. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the point you made about powerful women. I, I don't quite know what to say to that. <laughs> um, um, I do realise that um, there is definitely the whole issue of power asymmetry, you know, and, and we see that. And I think that the, the, the agricultural sector is, um, is one that is really reflective of these power asymmetries that we see. I mean, it's not the only one, but I think that's where women are most present in Africa. Um, and I think there's a lot of women that are sort of dying to have real business ventures, you know, and it could be in energy entrepreneurs, for instance, you know. But, but, but I think that the system sometimes, it's almost as if it's conspiring against women because it locks them into these very micro products, micro processes. Um, and it's not able to, so they're not able to aim for something big. I'd like to see you women cooperatives or whatever that can go to the bank and they're not going to be asked for huge collaterals and all of that and can actually do big business, big ventures, you know, not the sort of small scale, you know, um, activities that they're busy that they're busy with. So I think that one of the things that uh, if we if we want to take this provocative idea a bit uh, further is to say you know the Green Climate Fund for instance. We talk about readiness of how the Green Climate Fund can help countries become ready. So how can it help enterprising women who have got a good business model or business venture and they want to invest in that? How can it help those group? Um, to become ready and to have a bankable proposal or bankable project. You know, I think that is what um, it needs to do as well. So that it doesn't just stay within the confines of government, but it branches out of that and it reaches out to civil society. And I think to some extent that, um, Ivan, um, you know, the, 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 the general thinking is that civil society in Africa is relatively feeble, but we are seeing civil society beginning to really have a voice. I and mean, depending on where you go in Africa, actually in West Africa, civil society does have a voice. Look at what happened in Burkina Faso. You know? So I think that civil society can actually start engaging and calling governments to order and basically forcing governments to really you know, take notice. Um, but it comes from you know, a civil society that understands what the issues are, a civil society that's engaged, and that's also a civic responsibility. Government has a role in making sure that those opportunities are out there and civil society understands this issue and can challenge them. You know. But civil society is constantly now playing that challenge function and we need more civil societies that are able to do that because the more we have, I mean, if you look at civil society here, it's very different, very, very different from civil society in Africa. So I think, um, you know, most people are not so afraid of the state, as you would see in, in, in Africa, you know, because civil society has got a powerful voice. But perhaps we need to see more Burkina Fasos emerge. <laughs> um, 
Is that, is that it, or was there another question so. that I missed? I think so. I think so. Maybe, maybe I close and you take it. No, I, I just want to really thank Fatima for uh, her wisdom and sharing that with us. And uh, Fatima talked a lot about changing the narrative, yes? So I want to send several messages coming from what your answers and your comments and questions on this. I would say that the first one that comes to mind is changing the narrative as looking at women as the vulnerable sector and not as a big part of the solution. So women are not the problem. They are a big part of the solution. And we have to change the narrative there, too. You said, Fatima, we have to change the narrative in thinking about sustainable development in terms of trade-offs and not in terms of triple wins. We have to start to talk about the triple wins and not only about the trade-offs. And uh, you talked about climate change, but you talked also about ecosystems. And uh, uh, if my numbers are right, what I know is that 2 billion people in the world live up on ecosystems. So it's not only about jobs. It's about livelihoods, if we really want to go through sustainable development. And you said we need not only governments, but we need to bring the private sector. But we need to level the playing field for that, in terms of incentives. Nobody talked about subsidies here, but subsidies are not allowing us also to level the playing field for sustainable development options. And uh, finally, let me say that Fatima talked about values. And I think that that's a very important part also of this agenda. Values and a new humanism. I come from Costa Rica, you know, and we did three things that nobody advised us to do that change the country. Yeah? We declare education universal and free for boys and girls in 1870, when we were the poorest part of Central America. We uh, abolished the army in 1948, and we protected 25% of our territory in the 70s, when sustainable development was not on the fashion. So no economist, I am an economist, will have advised my country to do this. It was because of values, and because we thought about the long term and not only the short term. And to do that, we need civil society, and we need citizen engagement, as you said, Fatima. So I leave you with that, and I pass the, the mic to uh, Camila, and I really thank you so much, and I think that you deserve a big applause for <laughs> They're, they're quite a dynamic duo, these two. They're both on my board of trustees, so you can see we have some great conversations. But I also wanted to thank you very much as an audience. You've been really engaged. We've had a whole slew of questions. I know you've got a lot more that we could talk about. Um, but rather than sitting in your seats, I'd like to suggest that we get up and we go and have a drink, have a nibble, have a chat. The, there are a lot of us in this room who are working towards trying to make sure that the COP in Paris at the end of next year gives us real foundations for building that more resilient, better adapted, um, more ambitious, low-carbon world that Fatima outlined so clearly. It's interesting to see uh, Africans such as yourself seeing climate change as potentially that kind of spur for major visionary change in terms of government, in terms of forms of investment, particularly investment in people, in youth, in women, and in energy, without which none of this can really be brought to fruition. So thank you very much for coming. Please do come and join us, because there's a lot more to talk about. Thank you. <laughs>